Well, this looks like a 12-step program for recovering defense acquisition types. I mean, I uh, w w welcome. We're glad, we're glad you're all here. Uh, we appear to be going through another one of those great cycles uh, of uh, life in Washington where we've rediscovered the need to reform ourselves. And, um, uh, you know, it's, we've got a very rich history of failure that we can point to, that, uh, that we, can, we can look to. Hopefully today we'll have a, maybe we could take a little bit fresher view of the whole thing. Uh, first let me just say thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my sense is that uh, th there may be a modest opportunity to get a little bit more done in this environment. Uh, the Secretary has put down some pretty big markers over the last couple of weeks, and I've had a couple of conversations with him and others in the department to say this, this is a, that's a pretty genuine effort. It's not, uh, this is not kind of like one of your Potemkin Village initiatives that's designed to look good to get you through the year. Um, I think there's there's some something quite real and genuine here, and um, uh, and probably the one of the most interesting dimensions of this one is that uh, there is going to be there are very real and rather tough budget targets that have been put in front of people, but the services get to keep the money. Now that's uh, that's a fresh change if it works. Uh, now. You know, Washington is the kind of place where, you know, you offer up your neighbor's meal to, for, to, so that you don't have to give up your own and see if that gets past the boss. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's an invitation to uh, serious knife fighting uh, in town, but we're, it, we're in the front end of it. And so the question is, can it be made rational? Now, you know, I think the starting point is uh, the legislation from a year ago. Um, and I will protect the, uh, the innocent with this observation that in talking with a few senior people in the department and asked their observations about the bill, they said we were able to keep it from doing any damage. Okay, you know, uh, there's a pretty far gap between the perspective of the professionals in the building and the people who wrote the legislation. I mean, they thought that this was the best thing since canned beer. And the people in the building thought that it's, well, we at least were able to keep it from doing any damage. Okay, now that's a, that's a broad gap, you know. Uh, and uh, we're now trying to figure out where is this thing really going to take us. Now, David's been looking at it. And, and, and look, we want, we want this to succeed. I mean, I think there are some elements of it I certainly still have some lingering reservations about. But it doesn't help to be fighting a decision that has been made. It's, it's our goal is if it wasn't the best decision, how do we turn it into the best decision? And how do we implement it and make sure that this is constructive? And I think it's in that spirit that we want to bring all of you together today. It, um, David, you're going to lead. I, th I think you're, you're, you've got just a very brief time to stay in front of this mob, you know, and with your ideas. And then we're going to open this up for everybody to take over. But uh, thank you for doing it, and we'll let you get this thing started. Thank you. So, thank oh, you. I should just just say we want to uh, just welcome uh, Alexander Weiss and his team from the European Defense Agency. Alex is right down here. And uh, they're in town. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, uh, like all things Europe, hopelessly confusing to an American, but has really great promise. You know, I mean, it's the sort of how does Europe come together? Uh, and it needs to come together. It needs to come together as an integrated whole. Now, I, oh, I'll say one last anecdote. You know, I remember one time being at a, at a dinner party with a, a senior Russian general, and he was sufficiently into his, into his cups, you know, so that he said, he said, I now know what your strategy is. He said, you give all of your services enough money so they can defeat each other and still beat us. Well, it's all done, you know, and so <laughs> we're <laughs> so we know a lot about rivalries uh, here in the United States, and we celebrate them, uh, and so we ought to be pretty modest about saying that EDA is what it's got in front of it. It's a it's a new experiment. It's going to be extremely important, and we want to be helpful. So welcome, Alex. We're glad to have you and your team here. David, let's turn to you. Let's get Thank it going. You, Do you want this? Uh, we can turn that off. I'm going to use the. I want to add my welcome 
I suspect that uh, uh, to the Europeans in the room, Dr. Hamry's comment that your experiment is something we don't necessarily understand. We might be able to say the same thing about the discussion into which we're about to embark this morning. It may seem a bit worthless uh, to the outside observer, not necessarily you guys because you watch us very closely, but to anybody who didn't understand the nature of what we're doing in defense acquisition, they would likely look at the discussion we're about to have and say, can't you guys get a real job? You know, the, what is the point of all of this? All right, May 22nd, 2009, it was a Friday. The President signed into law uh, the Weapon System Acquisition Reform Act, which was a phenomenally successful exercise in Congress agreeing with itself numerous times in rapid succession. Uh, the bill was introduced um, in, uh, in the Senate, uh, unanimously marked up out of committee, passed the floor unanimously, a parallel bill, uh, the skelton McHugh. Uh, a bill was introduced in the House, uh, came out of committee with unanimous support, came off the floor with unanimous support in a remarkable display of adhering to regular order. A conference committee was appointed. It convened. It actually conferred on the bill, uh, produced a, a decent conference bill and conference report, uh, which was unanimously passed by both houses and signed into law uh, by the President in a time that took, I think, less than four months. You could almost use this as a case of how Congress works in a high school civics class. Um, it may be the only one in living memory uh, that will <laughs> meet that test. Which, of course, raises the question of if something is so quickly done, can it actually be worth much? Because if we actually had unanimous, I mean, even the Improve Acquisition Act had three negative votes in the House side. I won't. Uh, actually, I, it probably wouldn't embarrass them if I named who they were because they were actually quite proud of their vote against it. But uh, um, so there's it, it, almost always some flake who will stand up and say, uh, I don't support that uh, bill and so I'm going to vote against it. Um, but in this case, I think at least in the minds of both the authors of the bill and those who, uh, who pushed for its passage, and in fact in the words of the President himself, there seemed to be substance here that people thought was actually worthwhile. Uh, Dr. Hamry's comment, uh, uh, unnamed, but I heard similar comments uh, from the Defense Department that uh, at least we got out of this with no serious harm. And some of that, of course, actually reflects earlier versions of the bill and what did come out of it. Uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, efforts to, for instance, uh, create an independent cost assessment activity that was outside the normal chain and not even connected with program analysis and evaluation. Uh, many in this room opposed and, and did so on the record. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that opposition, in addition to the department's concerns, led to the structure that's put in place today. But what we said at the time and what we're convening here today to do is say, okay, let's get back together after a year and take a look and see how it's working. Um, at one point, I actually thought I would call this a report card, but then I realized after one year, uh, the grade would be incomplete. Um, in fact, it's not really clear to me how long we will have to go before the grade is anything other than incomplete in a sense of uh, an academic exercise of reviewing and pronouncing how done we are. Because that's the reality of the acquisition change business, is it never gets to the point where you put your feet up and say, okay, we're done. Now let's go do something else. This, uh, it's a lifetime of endeavor. And uh, you know, I, I look around the room here, and many of you have been engaged in this uh, for most of our professional lives. And so uh, we come to recognize that. So instead of a report card, we call it a progress report. And what we've attempted to do is, first of all, define how we're going to measure longer-term success. And I think it's really in two ways. Uh, one is actually whether or not programs adhere to cost and schedule and performance in ways that they are aligned to and expected to and budgeted for. And that was probably the real goal of the act itself. Um, but there is actually a second measure, and it may be a more valid, if more difficult, one to measure. And that second measure is, do we actually deliver the equipment and the capability needed by the warfighters? 
um, which in theory is the point of all this in the first place, although as we well know, sometimes there is a gap between what is required and what is needed, uh, and that, that will come into play later on. Um, but by those two measures of success, um, you can't really tell. It's way too early. So we take a more pedestrian approach from a progress report point of view, and that is we look at each of the sections in the bill and we say what's happened in terms of implementation of that section. Uh, we give you today actually two different documents. Uh, what I have just described is the second of those documents. It's a, I believe I have a copy here, except I appear to not have it. It is called in a sideways title page, the Weapon System Acquisition Reform Act Implementation Progress Report, and it goes through section by section. And I know there are already things in this section that are either incomplete, inaccurate, or, um, uh, or have changed uh, because that happens in this business and, it, and we'll continue to refine and revise this, uh, but it will be posted and available uh, on our website um, and uh, something that can be referred to uh, by those who find it useful to go do a section-by-section -section analysis. Um, and then we put a small text together, about an eight-page discussion and summary of, of what some of the implications of that section-by-section -section implementation analysis would do. And I, I'm not going to go through it and brief it. Uh, that would be um, far too um, uh, time-consuming, uh, and there's actually not much in there that will surprise those of you who keep track of this on a regular basis anyway. But let me highlight a few points. Uh, there are a number of major organizational changes that were called for in the Act. Uh, the establishment of the Director of Cost Analysis and Program Evaluation and the whole office flowing from that person as a Senate-confirmed uh, uh, presidential appointed position. Uh, Christine Fox has been in that position since early November and the organization is pretty much up and running. Uh, it still needs people, it still needs capability, um, but it's a, um, uh, a, a check mark in the yes column in terms of implementation. Similarly, with the establishment of the new Office of the Director of Systems Engineering, uh, the Office of the Director of Defense uh, Test and Evaluation, Systems Engineering had already been established prior to the enactment of the law. It's been beefed up and its role has been somewhat expanded. Both of those two organizations, DT&E and Systems Engineering, uh, were placed in OSD uh, un under the Director of Defense Research and Engineering. Um, at the time, uh, that was the uh, place where they, were, where they were organized. Some have raised the question as to whether that's the appropriate place for, uh, for an organization to be, and uh, I leave that question for later discussion here if anyone wants to raise it. Uh, the fourth is the Office of uh, Performance Assessment and Root Cause Analysis, affectionately known as PARCA. Uh, you don't want to wear this parka. Actually, you would like to not ever be anywhere near this parka because it means that you didn't do so well. Um, and that office uh, took a while to stand up, but Gary Bliss, who many of you know, is, uh, is the director. Um, resources are being sought and eventually will be applied uh, to that office as well. Uh, but just in the nick of time, because the Improve Acquisition Act uh, uh, that passed the House uh, has expanded their responsibilities well beyond MDAPs to, uh, as far as I can tell, darn near everything. So um, uh, they're going to, they're uh, before they even get their arms around their current challenge, uh, if that is enacted into law, uh, they will have additional opportunities. So from an organizational perspective, those pieces are, are kind of up and running. Um, there are a host of process changes uh, that come into play. Uh, cost realism, uh, better upfront assessment, particularly uh, uh, what we used to call milestone A, uh, which sometimes now is not a milestone, but uh, 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 better reporting, uh, which better is from the point of view of those who receive the reports, not necessarily those who have to prepare and send the reports. Um, and from a process change point of view, much of the directive instruction for that process change was issued uh, by the Undersecretary for Acquisition, Ash Carter, when he signed the directive type memo uh, on December 4th of 2009 and laid out the implementation steps for uh, uh, WASARA. Uh, but the real process change, that is, is it producing results that are discernible are better cost estimates being used in the budget for budgetary decision purposes? Do they get reflected in the program schedule uh, and structure that's approved uh, at the milestones. Um, that is playing out program by program, item by item, budget by budget, 
there's very little in the FY11 budget that reflects this new structure and process. There will be more, one can presume, in the FY12 budget, but we won't see that until next February. So we're a ways away uh, from being able to, uh, to discern that. Um, those of us who, you know, professionally watch the waters to see what's churning underneath at the Pentagon uh, are able to detect some activity which indicates uh, debates over cost that seem to tie back to a more realistic set of cost estimates. Um, but it's a little early to judge whether the turmoil at the surface of the water is actually going to produce anything different uh, once the wave actually reaches the shore, uh, which will be when the budget is delivered to Congress. Finally, there are a number of policy issues that sort of rise above the level of process change. Um, a very strong re-emphasis, not surprisingly, uh, because Carl Levin, who pushed this, uh, is the father of the Competition and Contracting Act and was the senator who, when Frank Carlucci brought his original 31 initiatives up to the Congress, Senator Levin leaned forward and said, Mr. Secretary, aren't you missing one? And so competition became the 32nd initiative in Frank Carlucci's uh, acquisition reforms. Uh, the, uh, and, and so Senator Levin put a strong emphasis in, in Wasara on uh, competition. It, it uh, reinforced the requirement that had already been levied in the revised 5000.02 uh, DOD instruction to uh, uh, require competitive prototyping, except when we don't. Uh, that exception, of course, is not in the instruction, but it is in the practice. Um, but that emphasis on, on competition and competitive prototyping was strongly reinforced in, in Wasara, and it remains um, something that DOD does when it's convenient, easy, and affordable, and struggles with when it's hard and expensive and when the payoff is well beyond uh, the uh, near-term costs. The near-term costs are too hard to swallow. Um, this, of course, has been true even in rich times, which we've had for the last decade, it will become much more difficult in the leaner times that, uh, that face us down the road. Um, one final uh, uh, policy point, of course, was the question of uh, implementing stricter uh, rules with respect to organizational conflicts of interest. And uh, here's one where those of you who watched the, the legislation play out, uh, there were originally some extremely stringent requirements uh, which would almost have forced companies to divest themselves of, of uh, entities that were operating, if you will, on both sides of the organizational line. And, uh, uh, and the final, final bill provided both more flexibility and really left the ultimate implementation up to the Defense Department. There is now a draft uh, out f uh, through the Federal Register for public comment. I think the public comment period may actually have closed. No, it's still, it's still open. Uh, on, uh, on uh, a revision to the uh, regimen by which we determine organizational conflict of interest. Um, my reading of it is uh, it won't solve the problem, and, uh, and, but since it's uh, only a proposed rule that's out for comment, uh, we'll have to see what the final element comes into play. Uh, but it is certainly an element of WASARA that uh, um, was a very strong point of the legislation that still remains to be implemented, and there's a significant policy issue associated with it. That kind of policy question, of course, flows into areas beyond WASARA. WASARA, other than even, even in the organizational conflict of interest, was just aimed at major defense acquisition programs, the MDAPs that are the, uh, the lifeblood of, of defense acquisition. But there, as in a number of the other policy areas, the policy implications of what you do for major weapon systems has enormous impact on the overall acquisition process and acquisition structure. And that's one of the underexplored areas um, where both the department's implementation and in some ways the Congress's own understanding of the legislation it has passed uh, starts to fade as you cross that boundary from, from MDAPs into, uh, uh, into the broader acquisition system. So overall, I think our, our judgment from a progress report point of view is on a pure checklist basis, much of the things that needed to be done have been done. Uh, there are lots of overdue reports to Congress, but, um, but as you know, that's not an unusual situation. Um, you know, very rarely do we, does Congress put in the law that somebody goes to jail if the report is not su submitted on time. You pay a price, but you pay that price somewhere else. Um, but other than, other than that, much of the de many of the deadlines and much of the action required by a specific deadline has technically been met. 
Um, there is perhaps some bit of a missed opportunity here in that the implementation was done sort of one section at a time rather than an attempt to step back and take a comprehensive look at do we really want to use this opportunity uh, to revise and reshape the broader structure and the broader system. Um, I think it was deemed that that might be both too hard and too time consuming, uh, but there's no documented record of that. And so the net effect is one where the implementation was done uh, on, from, a, from a checking the box point of view uh, quite thoroughly and broadly. Um, the ultimate integration of those into a final product and a changed outcome remains to be seen. So that's kind of where we stand on this. I think from our perspective, this is going to be a living, ongoing activity. We'll continue to monitor this, update it periodically, probably as uh, events warrant when a big change occurs or, um, again, particularly when we get a lot more evidence, uh, one of which could be next year's budget. Those of you who watched Secretary Gates' speech out at the Eisenhower Library in uh, Kansas or read the subsequent reports of it, um, know that uh, he has, in fact, um, uh, recognized uh, quite clearly and publicly uh, both the reality of the future as he sees it and has issued a challenge to the department that says, you know what, I'm working on this. I'm going to be here to get it into place. That means in the FY12 budget and, the, and in the future year defense program that will flow from that. Uh, that's a significant step for this secretary and a very powerful challenge. Um, whether or not that money, the $15 billion or more that, uh, that he seems to think is out there, uh, can be found, instituted, uh, and uh, put into the budget and made to stick. Uh, many of us have been down that road a number of times, and it's funny how those cuts, somehow the money keeps finding its way back in when it comes to overhead and operations. And uh, I, I look around the room and I see a number of folks who have uh, donned the armor and climbed aboard the horse and tilted at those windmills in the past. And, you know, the windmills are still going and our armor has long since been shelved and so others are carrying that now. But, uh, uh, but if Secretary Gates is as serious about this as he seems to be and his track record, as he actually notes himself, of uh, success when he takes things on in a visible, public, uh, focused way, um, says that the rest of this page has not yet been written. And the reason I tie it back to this is because ultimately the impact of WASARA and of the changes that accompany WASARA will be seen in the programs and the program structures and the deliveries that come from that. And as we all know, one of the most significant challenges is will you actually put as much money in there as you need to execute the program that you know is going to be the case. WASAR is not silent on this point. It requires, in fact, that DOD fund its programs to the 80 percent confidence level. Now, it doesn't define how you're going to determine what that 80 percent confidence level is, nor does it specify why 80 percent is the right number, and some have speculated, uh, including authors of the bills, that, uh, that the number might need to be changed. Uh, but the reality is that uh, no matter what the right number is, the real test is and the real hard challenge is keeping that money in the budget when you don't have enough money to go around. So that's what we're watching for as time goes forward. Uh, um, we have a number of parallel efforts underway looking at uh, uh, issues like inherently governmental functions and, uh, and how you do a good cost comparison of uh, government employees versus contractors, uh, looking at questions like the implementation by the White House of its own uh, new guidance and policies on, uh, on contracting acquisition uh, noted in the President's own uh, memorandum of March 2009 on, on government contracting, efforts to improve uh, government contracting. These extend both beyond major weapons systems and beyond defense to the entire federal government. Uh, but they all tie together, and so we watch all of those as well. So that's our plans. Um, let me now pause, uh, take a break. I'll take a sip of water, and, uh, and we'll throw the uh, floor open for discussion and question. Uh, the ground rules that will follow there, number one, this is on the record and for attribution. It's being uh, uh, videotaped. It will be, this session will be posted on our website as well. Um, so uh, I say that both as, a, as a, uh, an invitation and an and alert uh, to you uh, because, uh, um, you know, we will, we will know who you are and, and what you said along the way, although those sitting along the back wall will be hard to get on camera, so you probably are safer than, uh, than the rest of us are. Um, the, uh, um, I would ask that if you uh, uh, do have something to say or a question uh, you'd like to raise, et cetera, uh, that you indicate if you have a name tag by putting your name tag up on end, 
uh, and I'll call on you when, uh, and then you can put it down when I do. If you don't have a name tag, you'll have to use what God gave you, you know, your left hand, your right hand, or uh, something like that, and that, that will work just as well. So let me uh, pause, throw the floor open, and, uh, and ask for questions, comments, and I do have some I'll call on in case uh, uh, you, you have none uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, there's a microphone. If you, if, uh, if you wait, uh, speak into the mic. That way we'll pick it up as well. So I'll, uh, I'll give the honor. General Scans, do you want the first comment or question, sir? That's very nice. <laughs> Dave, I would like to uh, go back to a fundamental, which at the end of your assessment, you, you said more about personnel than Wasara says. <clears throat> And if I went back to the 90s when we cut the acquisition workforce in half, uh, it was not done in any ordered manner. It was a numbers game, which the personnel people did. And so the retention of skills in acquisition was not a priority. It was just you get rid of people by the numbers. The net result is when we suddenly turned around and found out that we had gutted the acquisition workforce. Then the question became, how do you replace these kinds of skills? And we haven't done a very good job of doing that for a number of reasons. One is that <clears throat> the services are not prone to develop and protect and educate an acquisition workforce so that the people can see where they will gradually go in the system. You know, I think we lost a lot of bright people because they took a look and said, this ain't the career field that you think it is. And a lot of them went off to industry. Now, <clears throat> today, when we look at it, you know, rebuilding that workforce, uh, this legislation from Congress that says you can hire many people to reestablish this, and that's going to take a while, and the education process takes a while, and the most important thing is you don't automatically get experience. You know, you can have a master's or a PhD or whatever else it is, but if you don't get out to the field and work at it, you know, you don't establish your bona fides, so to speak. And, <clears throat> you know, in the Air Force, they're quick to tell you that it takes 10 years to get a good fighter pilot. I would suggest it takes 10 years to get a good acquisition guy. You know, if you have a major multi-billion dollar program, uh, your contracting, senior contracting people better be at the GS-15 level and have enough experience behind them in assignments to really have a handle on what they're doing. If you just do gap filling from wherever you can find it, then you're going to have government people across the table who are really not up to doing what needs to be done. And so how you rebuild that workforce is a very, very serious problem, and we've not been able to get a handle on it because it's, it's like a 10-year exercise. And, you know, who's going to be around for 10 years to help make this work? And so <clears throat> I think that is a major challenge, and uh, I would think it deserves uh, some kind of review in and of itself. That's, a, that's an excellent point, uh, the, the, the need for further review. We highlighted it, as you note, perhaps more than the law itself did, um, in part because we recognize the, the accuracy of what you said. The, the, the government's capability has been dramatically diminished, and it took way less time to get rid of people than it takes to add them back. Um, I would note that in 2007, when, uh, when I was part of a review, of contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we found at the time that the contracting workforce uh, had about 58 percent were operating uh, fully qualified. That is, they had both the experience level and the training for their position. In theater, it was only about 37 percent, which obviously is a bit of a problem. 
Um, I looked at data recently from the end of 2009, and while the numbers for Iraq and Afghanistan are up, the overall numbers for DOD are actually down, despite three years of emphasis on this. Um, and the problem isn't the training. We actually are able to get people through training whether it's level one, level two, or level three. The problem is you can't get years of experience without the clock passing. You don't get 10 years of experience by working twice as hard for five years, um, even though that's actually kind of what we're putting people through. And uh, I think there, there, there needs to be a, a recognition of that. At the same time, I think there's a different challenge. We don't have enough programs to put people on to rebuild the capability. Uh, it used to be that by the time you became a senior program manager, you would have worked on two or three or four very significant programs, and there just aren't enough now. So your suggestion that the time is ripe for a review of this may, may well have merit. I do think, though, that uh, in the realm of those who care about that, there's general agreement across the board, whether it's the executive branch, the Congress, the Defense Department, the White House, the industry itself, um, even scholars and pretend scholars. Uh, would agree that the, the time is right to put the energy into this and sustain it over the long haul, and I, I think we may be able to provide that 10-year view, but it's going to take the 10 years, and we let need to me, keep track how we're going. Dave, let me make one more comment. Uh, in the Air Force, like the other services, if you were assigned to a major new activity, your first inclination was to call in the IG and have them survey this whole enterprise that you're going to take over. I think in dealing with the acquisition workforce, if I rule the world, I would audit Air Force, Navy, Army, OSD. I would want to see how big the workforce was, what the skill set was, what was short, what was missing, and what the experience level was. And that kind of data is available. But the personnel system will shy away from trying to do that. But if I were going to run an enterprise, I sure want to know where I would be in terms of the acquisition workforce. Where's ground zero? Well, we will, we will take that as an offer to help us on that process, and, and we'll uh, okay. move forward there. So. Um, I saw that Gene Porter had his hand up. Uh, Gene, if you wait for the mic there and identify yourself. Uh, thank you, David. I, my compliments to CSIS for laying out this compliance matrix. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how much pushback you get from the department as to the accuracy of your characterizations of steps taken. But as you pointed out, looking ahead, uh, there's a few clouds on the horizon and there's heavy lifting still to come. I would be interested in your views and those of the here on uh, what you see as unintended consequences of the Wasara Act that may be, uh, may be coming down the pike. The, the question of unintended consequences, of course, is one that Congress asks thoroughly and often as it's moving forward with uh, legislation, and yet we still have them uh, when we finish up in, in the process here. Um, I have only two thoughts there, but then I'd, I'd love to hear the comments of a couple of others in the room who've had to live with this. Uh, when you're on the receiving end of any significant legislation, it always looks different than it does when you're at the sending end. Um, one of the unintended consequences is on the increased amount of reporting and the increased amount of revisiting of decisions, if you will, for anything that's uh, uh, past milestone B and run into trouble, you may have to go back and revisit the milestone. Um, this could easily create a situation, and I suspect it has in ways that we can't yet see because the, the, the reports have not yet come forward, um, where DOD is going to end up using substantial amount of pretty precious management time uh, documenting decisions that everybody knows exactly where it's going to come down already. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I was present at the creation of, of Nunn McCurdy, and the idea back in 1982 was that somehow uh, having to certify that you were going to keep going on a program that was in deep trouble um, or kill it was going to produce more kills. It has not actually done so. It turns out that getting a certification is much easier than killing a program. But we knew that 28 years ago. 
and we've known it every year since then. Uh, so piling on additional reporting requirements may not actually lead to more program kills, and, uh, and I think that's one of the unintended consequences. Are there others who see, uh, John, do you see any unintended consequences here that are worthy of note? <laughs> This one, there we go. Push, how's that? Good, okay. Um, I think one of the other unintended consequences may be if, if the Congress puts pressure on the department to implement this in a very vigorous way and the focus remains at the major defense acquisition program level in the department, uh, you only have so many acquisition people to pick up on what uh, General Scantz was saying, who have so much attention and so much time. And I think that w one of the outcomes I see with this bill is a big shift in resources and attention into the major defense acquisition program area to fully implement this while you have a growing and, in fact, a larger dollars going through on areas like services and other IT and other areas like that, which require some specific expertise that's somewhat different than the hardware side. Um, and so I think that, that the challenge for the department will be in the midst of their efforts to rebuild the acquisition workforce, meeting the mandates of this with these people and not letting the other areas be in any way neglected because the, the mandates are coming from Congress in those areas too. Thank you. Uh, Dave McNichol, you have your, your request up. I wonder if, if I could give you the floor to ask your question, but first ask that you comment on the unintended consequences piece as, as, as well. Is that too much of a... No, that's where I was going. Good, thank you. This one really pushes my buttons. Um, I think Park it had a number of uh, good ideas in it, but at a strategic level, I think it embodies two errors. Uh, one, or at least potential errors, I think it has a tendency to increase tribalism at the OSD level. And tribalism at the OSD level, I think, has gotten to such a magnitude that it is uh, uh, a major uh, detraction to the ability of that organization to function at all. And second, I think you touched on, in a sense, is the emphasis on more and more reliance on process. You put tribalism together with process, and day by day, people work the process, not try to achieve results. Thank you. Those are both uh, good additional unintended consequences. Um, I'm tempted to say it's a little bit like pornography. You'll know it when you see it. Uh, an example from uh, uh, period I served in the building was the antagonism between PA and E and controller. And neither of them liked ATNL very much. Uh, and if you take a look at the ambitions of the large organizations in OSD, policy, the resources clusters, ATNL, uh, I think it's fair to say that they all have imperialistic designs on running the entire department. And, and the result is a fair amount of effort dissipated in border conflicts that should be spent on actually getting results. I'm going to call next on Bob Sewell, and then I have Dave Patterson after him. Bob? Well, I was going to comment on the question on the unintended consequences. Um, and for one, of, one of the big parts, of course, of the legislation was the effects on P&E and, and now CAPE. Um, and you mentioned that there were those of us who thought it was a bad idea to have separated out the cost function from the other parts of P&E, and that, that was avoided in the legislation. I think that's what the people in the department meant in the quote that John Henry had. But the other part of that that uh, is still open to question as to how it will turn out is the more subtle effects on the role of CAPE now within the department, uh, because you have a function that was traditionally the classic inside the building function now uh, with substantial reporting requirements and testimony requirements, which are both a large time sink for the director, Christine Fox, as well as put her in a difficult position in those uh, activities in terms of maintaining the you know, confident advisor to the secretary within the department while she also has the responsibility to testify uh, to the Congress on issues and 
you know, has the very difficult problem of defending the president's budget program, <laughs> which is her obligation, and at the same time answering truthfully and with credibility the questions that the Congress will ask on things like costs, which is part of, you know, her legal requirement under the legislation. So how that plays out is uh, could potentially be uh, unintended consequences. So do I get right that you think that it's possible that her advice might be watered down or diminished in some way internally because she would be concerned she'd have to testify about it before the Congress? Well, yes, or how the department involves her in decision making, uh, or how she's viewed on the Hill when she answers questions and has to, you know, give very carefully nuanced answers, um, you know, in order to, to walk that fine line. And then, of course, the credibility of the office in, on the Congress will uh, have a big effect on whether the current arrangement is sustained or not. I, I don't disagree with that, but ultimately uh, it, it seems to me possible that the real results of, of that will be measured more by uh, the outcomes of the programs, but of course it's quite possible that Christine Fox will long since have departed as the director and will have a different director because so many years will have passed. Uh, is that uh, also a concern you have? Well, yeah, and, and that gets back to the question you had about uh, you know, your, prog your uh, report card, because I think it'll take 10 years to come up with grades. And in fact, in the near term, the, uh, you know, there's tension between Secretary Gates's goal and successful implementation of this act, because in my view, if you, if you believe, as I do, that there's unrealism in some number of the programs out there, the correction of those, which is presumably a good thing, will actually require addition of money unless you are willing to substantially scale back either numbers of programs or their ambitions, which the department traditionally doesn't do very well. And so the likely outcome is more money having to be put in a lot of these programs, at least in the near term. I, I think that's exactly the measure, uh, but my suspicion is we actually won't have to wait 10 years. I think we'll see it in the FY12 budget and in the fit up associated with that budget. Um, and I, I, I have a sense that uh, uh, the, the programs that we know that are in trouble, that are either going to be visibly fully funded or not, uh, will, be, will be exactly the signal that we need to look at in, in uh, eight months when the President's budget comes forward. You, you know, just one last comment. Oh, I agree with that. What I meant by the 10 years is if you want to say, if you want to hypothesize that the Act will have made a big improvement in the process, right. Right. then you have to start with programs fairly early on, you know, build a realistic program and have a <laughs> successful execution of that. And in 10 years, you'll be able to look back and say, oh, that was a very good program because we followed the, the Act. Uh, you know, I think it'll take that long to get successes through the pipeline. And, and how many new starts do we have uh, coming up in, in DOD now? You can count them on the fingers of, uh, of your hands. So um, let me, uh, uh, do you have a, a one-second rebuttal a quick, here? Yeah. quick addition to that, um, I strongly agree with what Bob said. Looked at it from the narrow point of view of a CAG chairman, it's going to be very tough to be a confidential advisor to at &L and a confidential advisor to his adversaries on the Hill. Um, well, Dave Patterson, you've had the opportunity to do both of those things, so, uh, but that's probably not why you had your card up there. The floor is yours, sir. Yeah, I kind of find myself between reality and cynicism, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, um, I think that, that what has to happen is you, you, you talk about unintended consequences. I actually think the, in, the consequences are fully intended. And uh, what you see is how people react to what, what the expectations were. But if you take it to a level of abstraction a little bit higher, you find that here is the Congress providing direction to a bureaucracy in hopes that they won't be bureaucratic. Well, wait. I mean, <laughs> you, knew, you knew it was a snake when you picked it up. And we do this over and over and over. And, and, and until someone says, wait a second, we're going we're to stop this foolishness and we're going to start and we're going to start to baseline things. You talk about 10 years, you will have 10 changes in 10 years. Where's the baseline? How do you know what was going to work and what isn't going to work? We never give things a chance to do that. And so consequently, uh, I think the intended consequence was that there would be more reports, that the reports would keep staffers in business, 
and the staffers would then claim oversight over programs and life would be good. One data point that we ran across as we were doing one of our studies is that, and I'm probably going to get this specifically wrong, but generally sort of right. Um, one program manager said that he did a quick study and, and noticed that if he added the time spent on reports and reviews, that it was four program years. And I said, well, why don't you just, we'll just plan for the first four years as program reviews and reports, and then we'll get to the business. But think about that. The entire program, four years worth of reviews and reports. I mean, this, this is a terrible waste. And, and yet, that's, that's what we're faced with. So there are some very fundamental things that need to be changed. And, uh, and, but bureaucracies are going to do bureaucratic things. We're going to, as uh, General Scant said, we're going to take a bureaucratic approach to, to personnel. OK, who, uh, who's eligible for retirement? Great. Those are the people that we'll get rid of first because they're volunteers. Where's all the experience and skill sets and the people who are eligible for retirement? Oh my gosh. I think, uh, I thank you. Those are, those are both very good points. I, I would note from the point of view of, of unintended consequences or intended consequences, one of the things that we rarely do in this business is actually step back and ask ourselves, what's working right? Where are the programs where in fact we're on schedule, under budget, delivering performance, and in fact, I was having a conversation with a former program manager of such a program earlier this week, and he commented, you know, things were going so well, it only took me 10 minutes on the Hill to get my budget defended, and then I got to spend the rest of my time actually managing my program. Now, I'm thinking to myself, is that a cause or is that a result here? Uh, uh, because in, in many ways, uh, you know, you're going to have a better program if the program manager gets to spend his or her time managing the program. But the reality is things were going well, and so they had the opportunity to do that. Um, this, GAO does what it calls best practices, but best practices is rarely a legitimate assessment of, of actual successful programs and, and what all the elements of success were. They tend to pick individual best practices and aggregate them rather than actually analyze a specific program success story. Um, but I think it might be worth spending some time looking at that question as well. I saw Bill Courtney had a, a hand up al along the side here. Is there anybody else that I'm missing that, uh, that has a, a need? Right. Bill, the floor is yours. Last year saw uh, two significant developments, the Secretary's uh, cuts and restructuring of acquisition programs and WASARA. Which of those two is likely to have a greater lasting impact on how acquisition um, reform, if you will, goes? Secretary's decision seemed to be an act of political courage, and it certainly has had a broader political salience than WASARA has had. Um, but is Wasara likely to have more impact or an act of political courage by a Secretary of Defense? I, I'm sure there are others in the room who have a different view. My belief is actually the interaction of the two that's what's going to make the difference here. Um, ultimately, no amount of better program judgment or program management or additional reporting um, will substitute for the fact that uh, the number one cause of problems is we don't have enough money and we don't put enough money on the programs uh, along the way. That's not a root cause. That's a proximate cause because, in fact, other decisions are made that contribute to that along the way. Um, what I think Secretary Gates's focus, both from his April uh, cuts of, of 2009, um, obviously the, the FY11 budget that was released last February in the QDR didn't have much in the way of new program kills. There was actually only one MDAP that, that gave money back to the budget, and that was CGX uh, in terms of FY11 program kills. Uh, but I, I, I think that those who think that that meant the end of the Gates impact are only wishful thinking, and when FY12 comes around, you'll see round two of, of those cuts. Um, but if they're only done to pay budgetary bills, then they actually will make the situation worse. And we've seen that happen o over and over again. Um, now, I don't know that WASARA itself 
changes that, but it presents the opportunity if used properly for the department to change that. And that's really where I see that coming down. Let me uh, ask any reactions or final comments. We'll wrap up and, and be done by 10, which is the time we uh, appointed that we would re release you all back to uh, productive work or productive unintended consequences. But comments on, uh, on, on particularly on Bill's last question or anything else? Bob? Jerry. Yes, thank you. My, my, mine is a question. In a couple of areas, you pointed out that the implementation of WASERA has gone beyond uh, the focus on MDAPs that is the predominant focus of the legislation. And that seems to be sensible not only for the reason that if you focus only on MDAPs, it may, as has been pointed out, detract from other programs, but also some of the good ideas that are in the legislation would seem sensibly applied to other programs. Um, do you see that trend increasing or decreasing in the second year of implementation, that is, taking some of the ideas of WSERA and extending them beyond the MDAP arena? I've, I think that there, there are many who felt on the congressional side, even when WSERA was passed, I mean, typically when Congress passes a big chunk of legislation, the attitude is, well, let's move on to the next thing now. We've, we're done with this, okay, it's fixed. Um, the, uh, w whether it's true or not, that's, the, that, that's, the, that's generally the, the, the sense. But that was not the sense that you got at the time that WSARA was passed. There was a clear sense across uh, both the Armed Services Committees and, uh, and other elements of Congress, Government Operations and Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, that there was more work to be done. Part of that uh, you saw picked up with, uh, with the House Armed Services Committee Defense Acquisition Panel and its report that came out earlier this year and the new legislation that accompanied that. Uh, part of it was uh, incorporated into last year's Defense Authorization Act, uh, uh, the direction to uh, implement changes in, in IT acquisition uh, consistent with the Defense Science Board report that was required in the Act. Uh, and DOD's working on its response to that. So I, I think it will continue to, to go on. There's no, there's no sense on the part of, uh, of the Congress that uh, work is done. Uh, the danger, of course, is that uh, um, legislation will be modified and improved before it's actually taken effect. Um, because, my goodness, we passed Rosar a whole year ago. You know, and what has changed since then? They still haven't even finished implementing it yet, so isn't it time to do some more work here? So I think that's uh, one of the dynamics it needs to work in. But the, the, the need inside DOD, I believe, um, is, is really a binary pull in, in two different directions, as, as John pointed out. The focus on MDAPs, and that's really where you get into trouble. That's where you, your 110 percent cost overrun is the headline story. Uh, the 110 percent cost overrun on a on a, uh, a services, a small services task order contract is not going to get the same kind of, uh, of attention. And so the, the, the focus from a governance point of view internally will tend to be there. Uh, but the, prob the problems and the challenges really extend across the board, including rebuilding the workforce, which clearly you can't do just for your 86 favored programs, if you will, and you've got to do uh, for other things as well. Uh, Bob Sewell, you have the, uh, the final word, sir. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to make one comment that goes back to this issue of how do you measure progress in this thing because of the, the problem with the acquisition system taking so long and, and there being a lot of changes along the way uh, for any given program. And it seems to me, and this is something you might look into, Dave, in your, in your further explorations, is to me the, where the rubber meets the road is how does the conduct of the reviews that go on within the department actually change? And the ones that, you know, Rash Carter and Frank Kendall are preside over as well as their service counterparts and what kind of information do they have what kind of assessments do they have what kind of choices do they have you know when they're making the actual milestone decisions um, one of the things the department is very good at and this relates back to Dave Patterson's comment I guess about bureaucracies I think it's true of bureaucracies in general is they're very good at having someone come in and say, I want you to change, and saying, well, we're already doing that, right? <laughs> Everybody recognize that phrase? <laughs> I used to use that one. Um, and that's, I think, the danger here is that, I mean, you can go through your checklist here and say everybody checked all the boxes, and if everybody keeps doing what they were doing before, then I'm not sure that much is really going to change. And so in terms of how kind, you know, do we get good technical assessments at early parts of programs? 
do we get, you know, the uh, realistic understanding of the technology challenges and the cost implications of that? And do we get the requirers looking at the trade-offs in light of those kinds of facts and giving the acquisition executives real choices to have realistic programs that meet the needs of the warfighters? You know, that's what you really want to have happen. And, you know, these things that are the, in the legislation can, can help with that, but not if everybody just keeps doing the same old thing. Uh, and so that to me would, that you could start to see earlier, rather, you can't see outcomes for quite a while, but you might be able to see conduct, whether it changes or not, relatively sooner. That's, a, that's actually a very good measure and a very good point to watch. I think that uh, we ask ourselves why did we spend time on this other than the fact that it gives us the opportunity to have a meeting like this with people that we like to meet with. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the value that CSIS will add to this process is, uh, is measured by whether or not it helps the executive branch and the Congress do a better job of executing what they're, what they're attempting to do. And, uh, and so in, in that spirit, if you will, um, we're very comfortable with the idea that uh, there are errors and omissions in, in, in our report. And as Gene noted, we'll be happy to get uh, pushback or the opportunity to be smarter tomorrow than we were yesterday. Um, which, uh, which, which I, uh, is always the, the best thing you can do when you appear before Congress is admit that it is possible for you to be smarter tomorrow than you were yesterday, and with their help, you're probably going to achieve that. Um, that's, that would be my, my uh, Christine Fox approach, if you will. But uh, uh, so we welcome input from all of you and uh, happy to, uh, to take that into consideration as we go along. I think our, uh, our objective is both to continue to measure and track this and to report on it in such a way that it actually does help those who are trying to do a better job uh, get the support they need and those who are in the way of that to um, be helped to an earlier retirement uh, than otherwise possible. So, um, so thank you very much for your attendance and your contribution here this morning. And, uh, and we'll call you when we're ready to do this again. Thanks a lot.